recording, can't tell. Sorry, just faffing with AV. Thing comes from in a kind of deep history of technology to get to the 
interesting stuff at the end, which is what happens when we start to finance technology development in a different way. Um, and so I'm just going to scoop by this. Ron Cooks, right? Nobel Prize, 1940, Nature of the Firm, suggests that the purpose of a company is to uh, take the expensive, difficult project of making a decision and then spread the benefit of that decision across as many people as possible, all from essentially paying a little bit for the decision. So, if you work for IBM, IBM has to decide whether they're going to develop the future in C or in Java. They get a whole bunch of smart people to sit down and think about that, and eventually they pick Java. You benefit from that decision because you were basically going to just pick a language out of a hat. They had an analytical team that made the decision for you. You therefore take the salary rather than a contracted rate. This is Coase's fundamental theory that companies exist to make decisions on behalf of their employees and that that service is worth enough that the employee does better that way than if they were an independent contractor. It's certainly not the whole truth about why companies exist, but it's a huge part of it. The reason this is relevant is Coasean constraints typically bound an enterprise. Things don't get any bigger than Coase will allow them to be. Because when you get an enterprise which is too large, it begins to make wrong decisions. They're generating an insight into what it is they want to do in the future. They apply the insight, but the organization is so large that the cost of making the decision is now higher than the domain you can apply it to. So really big companies try and make smart decisions, but actually the decision doesn't apply to one part of the company because the thing is just too sprawling. So the more regular and monocultural company is like Walmart, the easier it is to make these decisions across the whole thing. But the more specialized and technological and fast moving it is, the smaller the enterprises tend to be. Does this kind of make sense as a model? So once you begin to understand that the domain of power that accumulates inside of an organization is related to how far its decisions are valid, what you begin to understand is that political power embodied inside of the leadership of an organization is directly backed by its ability to make new decisions. This is another way of saying that things get big because their governance is wise. So if you can begin to pull this thread out and say, right, so what gives political legitimacy to an enterprise is the wisdom of the decisions that it makes, that's a different notion of where the political legitimacy comes from than the idea that you get political legitimacy by running out and getting your hand on a piece of land first. I think you can begin to see that when you begin to reframe the political debate in these kind of terms, effective decision making is the political mandate, not possession of land. Uh, These things grow based on their ability to make effective decisions for everybody that's subscribed to them. You begin to get this little smell of like, that smells like blockchains. That smells like bottom-up organization. That smells like something interesting. So, second thread on this, why common terms? You know, does everybody know these guys? So, very successful investment house in the States. Uh, they give tiny amounts of money to small enterprises to try and see whether they're going to turn into a big thing. The sort of classic model is three college students over the course of the summer, you know, three months for three people, 50 grand off you go. What they've discovered is that they're really bad at picking winners. They're one of the best investment houses in the world, and 90% of the time, the things that they think will succeed is simply fail. 10% of the time, they make back about 10 times their money, which covers costs. And roughly one time in a thousand, they get some enormously spectacular thing like Airbnb. So with the best access to data in the world, and tons and tons and tons of human handling experience, they're still in a position of basically having a magic chicken that pecks at that proposals. And once we understand that even the most skilled humans in the world are unable to assess a new business idea accurately, they might be able to pick out a few things which are certainly going to lose, but they are definitely not able to pick out the things which will win. You begin to understand that this is essentially a random process. It doesn't have enough information in the proposal or from talking to the founders to be able to tell whether or not the idea will work on. And I think that there's a resolution waiting here, which is if we know that the VCs with an N of 600 or 800 or 1,000 are unable to tell the difference between winners and losers, it's almost certain that an individual entrepreneur will never be able to tell whether their idea is a good idea or not. And if we accept that an entrepreneur that is certain they're going to win is batshit insane, but an entrepreneur who says, I don't know whether this is going to work or not, but it seems worth a shot, is rational, 
I think we could see a kind of post-optimism entrepreneurialism. So entrepreneurs that really understand the statistical odds of failure, that really understand how unpredictable success is, and have a kind of methodical chopping block approach. You give me a bunch of money, I'm going to go out there and fail. If by some chance I leap out the window and fail to hit the ground, we will all be rich. And this notion that you could have a different emotional positioning of the entrepreneur that was less about arrogance and, and enthusiasm and more about rational estimation of the odds begins to hint at a kind of scientific, rational, entrepreneurial activity. Right? Quality of decision making is where institutions draw their authority from and there's this essentially random walk through the success space where the entrepreneurs and the VCs are basically throwing money at a random system with some ability to steer maybe, but not much of a qualitative basis, quantitative basis rather than known for sure. And out of this comes this kind of question, right? What if what we need is to fund an enormous amount of innovation, relatively randomly, because nobody's actually smart enough to know what's worth doing and what's not? And we all feel that technological change has slowed and is more or less stalled since the 1960s. Right? We are chipping away at technology incredibly slowly because it turns out to be really hard to fund stuff, particularly important crazy new stuff, and we can't get really big funds moved into things like global warming or finishing the job on polio or nanotech and biotech management, all this kind of stuff. Right? right in the middle of that mess, what we see is this incredibly broken landscape where we've basically forgotten how to spend money to get technological progress. And I think that we can solve that with blockchain technology. So that's what we're going to talk about. Ambitious enough. So, historical context. Right? I'm just going to fly through this. 1970s, we invent the database. All businesses of any size wind up with a big database in the middle of the shop. The database is an expensive piece of software which manages data that lives on tape. It's all about managing data on tape. Right? This is fundamentally what databases were, it was a set software for running tape drives. Unbelievable. In the 1990s, we did the entire thing again for computer networking. We built a whole bunch of technology around Ethernet cables, or token ring, or whatever it was, and we gradually started to connect all the world's stuff to the rest of the world's stuff. This is really fairly successful. The project goes very, really, really well, apart from the fact that we never succeeded in getting the databases to talk to each other properly over networks just never works. Every five years there's another attempt to standardize all the world's stuff so that the databases can talk to each other. XML, EDI, JSON, AJAX, uh, XML, um, uh, oh, what do you call it? Uh, JSON RPC, SOAP. You can probably name another couple of these things from over the years. They all break on the same problems. Uh, the first is the, the, N, the N squared problem. Every time you want two systems to talk to each other, you have to verify manually that the two systems connect properly. The more things you have trying to connect to the more other things, the more interconnections they have, and it grows as a square of the number of systems that want to talk. So you just wind up with intractable costs, because the larger your collaboration is, the more expensive it is to add each new player, and this is disastrous. The other problem is this philosophical problem. Right? That when you begin to put two things into connection with each other that are backed by database, the databases usually have fundamentally different understandings of how the world works. And when you connect them, you wind up with a piece of software in the middle, which basically translates one set of philosophical understandings to another. So, is it about the customer or is it about the invoice? Well, the bank will always think about the invoice terms, and the you know, uh, warehouse will always think of the product terms, and the front end will always think of customer terms. And when you get to the point of exchanging data, the different companies' assumptions make it impossible to get it across the bridge just without additional software. And we've been stuck at that for years, which is why every time you try and get two enterprises that are both working for you to talk to each other, you wind up taking the data yourself, mashing it with a hammer, and then handing it to the other guy. There's almost no seamless way for me to give an instruction to Amazon, to give an instruction to my bank, to give an instruction to somebody else. You just can't get flow through connectivity across the organizational landscape because we've never figured out how to get past this idea that organizations have a database with a network and the network exists to connect the databases. The databases were never designed to be interconnected. They don't work at 
pull when you try and do that to them. And as a result, all of our lives are in these broken up organizational silos with database <coughs> systems that don't quite talk to each other. And we've all got the experience of that anytime we try and do anything complicated with our stuff. The same problem exists in the government, but it's magnified a thousandfold. The government doesn't have a single database where it stores everything about you. Maybe the intelligence databases, but certainly not the operational ones. So every time you get different parts of the government trying to cooperate to do something, everything breaks down because each department has its own silo. The silos don't technically connect to each other, and as a result, the government is basically a balkanized, fractured framework in which different databases are failing to interoperate, so you can't get a common operational picture of what's happening in your society to make changes. It all goes back to the fact that the SQL database was never intended to be an interoperable system, and we've never solved the philosophical problems that prevent it from dealing. There is no fundamental axiomatic schema that all databases share right down on the basis that would allow you to have a philosophical interoperability between them. It just doesn't exist. As a result, everything that runs through bigger organizations is fractured. Does this make sense? Do you all have this experience? Right. It goes right back to the database data. So we get up to the present, you get to the teams, you get these blockchains. The thing about the blockchains that I think is most philosophically important is the ability of the blockchain to force everybody to work in the open. We take a whiteboard, we take turns writing something on the whiteboard, everybody can see what we've written. If we are having a transaction and we go backwards and forwards a bunch of times and somebody else wants to learn the standard that we're using, they can look at the history of past transactions and infer what constitutes a valid transaction during the cloud. And once you begin to think of this ability to examine the total transaction history as a way of learning how to do a transaction, once you look at that as you mess something up and you can then go and look at what happened and everything is there rather than having been lost on a wire because it just went over in a you know, millionth of a second, you begin to understand that there's this possibility that you could begin to fix the organizational bureaucracy problems around database interoperability using blockchains to bring everybody onto the same page. So if we had 50 other organizations that were cooperating and every step in the cooperation was done on a blockchain, it becomes very, very easy because there is no centralized schema inside of each organization. You actually have a database technology that was built from the ground up for interoperability and all of the organizations are sharing that working space together. And I think that this could potentially be the end of the silo problem that causes organizational organization. We could actually wind up with an easy flow of tasks and, and uh, structures between organizations because we finally have a database technology which is network native. And I'm incredibly excited about this. You know, it's easy for me to imagine 50 years in the future that when you have extremely large, complex uh, collaborations between multi-party entities, that it flows easily and it works, because we finally got technology that makes it look like we could get all the bureaucratic help. And I don't think it's going to take 50 years to implement that. I think it might be 20 years, it might be 10 years, it might be 5 years, because the technology is coming along real quickly, and the societies are desperate for better ways of solving these problems. So, smart contracts. Uh, raise your hand if you understand smart contracts. Yeah, I can start. Okay, so let me give you what a smart contract is in just really, really brutally simple terms. A smart contract is a Perl script that lives inside a blockchain. Right? It's just a little piece of code that lives inside the blockchain and it's got access to some amount of value and it assesses a set of conditions and if it agrees that those conditions have been met, it moves the value somewhere else. Now, I say Perl, it, it could be written in any language. We use, uh, Ethereum uses this thing called Solidity. It doesn't matter what you're using. Right? The fundamental useful thing about smart contracts is they are definitionally visible to all parties of the deal. So there's no ambiguity about how the contract will operate. Right? It's a chunk of code. You look at the chunk of code. Your text and their text agree what the chunk of code will do when it's actually run. Everybody loads their value into it. And even third parties can look at that and completely understand the nature of what's happening. So you get to these organizational interfaces where the silos meet. And rather than having my middleware and your middleware guessing what will happen when we send messages back and forth and praying that it actually works, 
we both agree on the text of the smart contract, we agree the smart contract, we put the smart contract in the blockchain and the deal is committed. At that point, the resources are committed, the evaluation metrics are completely clear, you get this potential for organisations to interoperate because you have these little snippets of code which are sitting in the blockchain and they are essentially a, a transaction which we have all committed to perform and exactly what happens when you have decided by the code on the day that it happens. Right? The smart contract is not magic, it's just a little computer program that has access to some value and an authority to spend it. But when you start thinking about what happens when you spook smart contracts into an environment where the inability to operate is crippling every single aspect of our existence, you begin to sort of look at that and like, wow, you know, I could actually have a smart contract that made it possible for my phone company to actually correctly communicate to my bank. Right? And you think of the direct debit as an instrument. It's absolutely archaic. It's terrible. You have massive authority to some institution that can make a billing error and just whack you for 1,500 quid because you let your phone accidentally turn on your roaming, right? You know, we're giving enormous amounts of authority over our bank balances and into our payment instruments, and all of that could potentially be fixed with smart contracts. Same thing is even more true when you start thinking about things like mortgages, right? Transferring a piece of property like a house from one place to another could be as simple as a smart contract that accepts when this escrow account has a value of more than £300,000, transfer the ownership to this other person. All of that conveyancing and the you know, half a percent of your house value gets charged to you by a bunch of middlemen, all of that stuff evaporates. If you want to rent a car, it's a smart contract. There's a chunk of code, there's a human translation of the code, it's all signed off that the human translation of the code is completely valid in court of law. You put some value into that, you know, there's your insurance, there's your this, that, and this. Automated enforcement of contracts for simple transactions, one aspect. The other aspect, complex collaborations between big organizations, because the code which runs the collaboration is not buried inside the middleware of each organization. <coughs> Does this kind of make sense? Right. What I'm pointing at is the possibility that blockchains are the organizational governance necessary to replumb the world into a system that actually works for and this is all about fixing bugs in 50 year old technology that nobody except enterprise data architects ever really directly confront. Right? Those guys get paid big bucks because they really understand at a philosophical level why SQL just isn't working. This is a little esoteric, by the way. You are getting the full esoteric version. Right. So let's get to the fun stuff equity crowdfunding. Does everybody have a pretty clear idea of what this looks like? Right? You get a bucket, everybody puts in 20 quid, everybody gets a tiny share of equity in the company. If the company turns out to be the next eBay, you get 2,000 quid back. Right. Hey. Hmm? I thought, I didn't think you got anything back from most of the crowdfunding sites. Ah, ah, equity crowdfunding. Oh, sorry. Ah, I see that. <laughs> equity, right? So regular crowdfunding, yeah. you put money in, nothing comes back. <laughs> equity crowdfunding. You put the money back, you get a tiny yeah, little yeah, share yeah. of the company, yeah. and you yeah. can actually make some real money. I just missed the equity words. Ah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Equity crowdfunding. Now, equity crowdfunding is obviously a good idea, right? It is very, very, very hard to find any rational argument about why equity crowdfunding is a bad idea. The only objections that you will typically see are what if the public get conned, right? And that coming from governments that actually operate national lotteries. Right? Yeah. yeah. What, what, are you, what are you talking about? You, to bingo. You allow people to sell cigarettes. <laughs> what are you talking about? The public will get caught. You're mad, right? So, yes, there are some quality control problems with equity crowdfunding as a model. You need some way of communicating to people the level of risk in an appropriate way. You might want to talk about reputation or rating systems. You know, a Moody's or a Standard and Poor for equity crowdfunding might be a good idea. There's all kinds of stuff you might want to do. But the basic idea is obviously sound. You sit there with a credit card, you swipe it, you own a tiny little share of a company that's manufacturing some weird looking device that you clip to a golf club, and if tens of millions of people like it, you make a lot of money back. It's just not done. Right? But right now, the regulatory frameworks around equity crowdfunding are crippling. And this is, I think, the key fight for the development of technology for the 21st century. 
So if we win the equity crowdfunding, I think we'd get pretty much a flying car each. And if we lose on equity crowdfunding, I think that we are potentially in a long cycle of decline into a kind of neo feudal patent barren landscape. Oh, bold stuff. <laughs> so, um, here's what I think you get to get equity crowdfunding right. In all probability, if equity crowdfunding becomes a norm, and you might go as far as to have companies which must be equity crowdfunded, so that you wind up with a distribution of wealth right from the first step. I think that's an interesting prospect. If you get a large company that winds up with enormous growth to the point where it's got hundreds of millions of users, at least it's probably got 20 or 50 or 100,000 owners. And the probability that most of the owners will be people that are regularly using the, the company's services actually changes the dynamics. So if Twitter was owned by 100,000 different Twitter users that had bought in early, I think you could be fairly sure that you wouldn't have promoted tweets. You wouldn't have all of this spam that they're being shuffle up. You'd have a privacy policy that actually worked. If Facebook was majority owned by 25,000 early Facebook users who were now worth 100, 200 grand more than they were when they started, I think you can be fairly sure that they would be doing a lot less of the kind of intrusive annoying stuff that everybody hates about Facebook. So the prospect that you could begin to have the owners of the service and the users of the service be substantially the same people, the simplest way of getting to the first run of that ladder is that enabling equity crowdfunding. And I think that it will provide better services for everybody because nothing is worse than having an absentee landlord. Right? Nothing ever gets fixed. You got a hole in the roof, the roof is going to stay with the hole in it for as long as it bloody well takes. Just nobody cares. And the vast majority of the technical services that you use every day are run by absentee landlords. It's not at all surprising that they're actually a big shit. So equity crowdfunding gives us this ability to imagine. Uh, a user panel of you know, 25,000 Facebook users that have the ability to appoint a board that will represent the interests of ordinary users like them. And I think that we would all be much happier if we lived in a world in which companies were run by people that were picked by the users of the services that they provide, rather than by a bunch of people that were there to squeeze the maximum and shareholder value out. This seems like a reasonable prospect. And I think that this notion that you decentralize asset ownership, particularly of high-tech assets that were being developed very, very quickly, using these kind of models, right? You go all the way back to the beginning, you think of this kind of venture capital magic chicken, right? The venture capital randomness suggests that we're not going to lose much economic efficiency by having crowds do the work rather than the companies. If the company's expertise actually turns out to not help very much, Given that capital allocation job over to the crowd, yes, you're going to get fashions and yes, you're going to get stupidity. I think you've got those things in venture capital now. I'm not suggesting that we're going to be shoveling money into a furnace in some completely inefficient way. I think we're already shoveling the money into a furnace, but we should let more people shovel more money into the furnace as long as everybody understands that these things are fundamentally non deterministic and that an investor pitch is basically just a very brightly, brightly Bingo card. Now, right? if you've got blockchains and smart contracts and all the rest of this kind of stuff, equity crowdfunding with the ability for people who have bought a share of companies to vote on who the directors will be becomes operationally really fairly simple. Right? You could take a really fat, complicated Ethereum smart contract and you could represent the entire equity crowdfunding process right the way through to board elections on. I would not want to be the person writing that contract, but I'm confident it can be done. Now, what you get out of that is an ultra-low transaction cost platform that allows people to buy shares of companies, sell the shares of companies to other people if they want them, and the current owner of the share can vote in a company election to pick the directors that will then run the company on their behalf. And that, as a single platform system, could potentially become the way that we do the vast majority of innovation funding right across the landscape in the same way that Kickstarter is rapidly coming to dominate new product development. Right? Go all the way back to Grand Park Hopes. Right? Mattel Toys exists to manage the capital for previous generations of toy sales and to invest it in new toy development. But 
that's only an efficient process if they're able to make decisions that are better than random. All the evidence is that for high-tech funding stuff like venture capital does, the ability for VCs to accurately pick is extremely low, at which point the natural size, given that authority flows from wise decision making, is extremely small. In a domain where it's really hard to get the decision right, it's natural for lots of small entities to just try random stuff and some of the crossword that it works. So what I'm suggesting is that the weight of fundamental economic efficiency given how hard allocating venture capital is, is towards tons and tons and tons of small enterprises doing it. And the only obstacle to that is transaction costs and regulation. So if we could cut transaction costs using blockchains and we could get somebody to okay the regulation, what comes out of that is the potential that you could begin to massively accelerate global technology development on a largely democratic basis using equity crowdfunding on blockchains. And I think this is amazingly exciting. Like, it is quite hard to get me genuinely excited about something that isn't like a water filter or a solar panel, right? <laughs> <laughs> really, you know, for, for good to get up in the morning and think, yeah, equity crowdfunding. This is a real, real, real slow thing for me. But I actually get to the point of thinking, like, this might actually be a big fix. Not, you know, not a little fix, not, not like a little bit as if, you know, a sugru connecting to a little bits of plastic. I think this might be how we re-democratize the means of production at the global scale. Why don't we enthusiasm? Check on the top. So check that one. That's what I thought. So, obstacles, right? Um, I've talked about this already to some degree. Fundamentally, for this model to not just be random facing the public, we have to accept that most of the investors are just random guessing or a little better. If you actually believe that an investment house has three times the probability of making a correct investment that a grandma from Iowa has, then equity crowdfunding is simply a way of causing the public to burn their money for things that will never give them a return. Right? It's extremely important that we've got to we put this as a method that is used in situations where it's extremely difficult for anyone to make a new decision. Because otherwise, the lack of access to high quality information means that there's an information asymmetry and therefore a power gradient between the investors and the equity crowdfunders. Right? If the investors just get really much higher returns on investment than the equity crowdfunders, the equity crowdfunders are being exploited. Right? But if the return on investment is roughly equivalent for equity crowdfunders and for VCs, and for that you've got to include all of the unsuccessful VCs all of the unsuccessful angel investors and all of the unsuccessful friends and family members that put money into you know, young cousin Joe's company. Right? If you include all of those failures, I think that what we'll discover is that equity crowdfunding and deep venture capital have very similar rates of return. But it's an incredibly important point that the argument has to be that they are not getting a worse return on investment than you would typically get from anybody else in the field. Um, with that said, on the other hand, given that we're dealing with governments that sell lottery tickets. <coughs> the other approach that you could take is you could say that an individual can only equity crowdfund up to some limit of their wealth, kind of like the US credit investor system. You could basically say it's their money, we don't care what they do with it, as long as the bets are small, we don't mind, $100 limit per crowdfund. There could be many, many different ways of managing that risk. But if we don't find some really coherent way of measuring the effectiveness, of equity crowdfunding models versus VC, it's hard to make the argument that the equity crowdfundings are not actually being taken. And that's a very important thing that we're going to have to think about at a philosophical, practical, regulatory level. There we go. Right. So, I'm going to basically skip this branch and I'm going to talk a bit more about how we fund the future using this model, but I'm just going to float over the surface of this. <coughs> equity crowdfunding is one of probably 58 different things that you could talk about as my global blockchains will change everything. Right. You know, I mean, woohoo, great. Okay, well, you know, next tomorrow I could talk medical records, the day after that I could talk land registries, you know, sometime after that I could talk carbon trading. You know, it's just everywhere you look. If there's an SQL database involved and a computer network, I guarantee you can apply a blockchain to it and something magical will happen. Right? The publishing industry. Well, you know, you could kind of equity crowdfund books and you could wire it all the way through to delivery and then you could have people compete for printing, you know, and you just, 
You could just hand wave your way through anything that currently runs on SQL databases and computer networks. You can, you can basically just you can talk about blockchain revolution and it'll almost certainly fit. Right. Now, strap in. We're about to have fun. Um, right now, <coughs> it's almost impossible to get fundamentally important new technology funded at the level we need to get it funded to make it work. Did anybody in this room ever actually take a Concorde? No, right? Might be a couple here that were old enough to do it. Concorde was, if you look, correct me if I'm wrong, three and a half hours from Boston. Right? It might have been two and a half. Sorry. Yeah, right? But they'd prefer to like, literally. So, we don't have Concorde anymore because it was economically inefficient. And because we couldn't organize the capital to fund the next generation of concords or the runways and everything else that we needed to make that work. If we had equity crowdfunding, I bet that we would still have Concord. Right? Because I think that you could have gone to the global public and said, for God's sake, it's a rocket plane, just give us money. <laughs> and I think we would have done it. It's really hard to convince a bunch of bean counters that it's really important that humanity has a rocket plane. But there's a willful enthusiasm in the love of technology that I think corresponds very closely to what humans actually need to build in order to survive. I think we are emotionally programmed to love a particular kind of gadgetry that has fundamental utility. Right? Think of the amazing love that small children have for animals pocket knives and fire. Right? And that's an evolved instinct. So I think that our over-enthusiasm for new technology is actually an evolutionary instinct on the same fundamental level as hunger or sex or the desire not to be wet and cold. And I think that we've created a situation where ordinary individuals have no way to express it, this kind of techno lust other than buying things that other people have made. They can't get heavily involved in the process of changing the world into a place with flying cars and jetpacks because we don't actually provide a social machinery by which an enormous number of people can actively create our future. And this is largely bureaucratic, regulatory, and transaction cost bound. The people want flying cars. They're willing to pay for them. The problem is that flying car dude has to go and find a bunch of investors that are willing to put in two and a half million quid for the next round. And what he really needs is the 85,000 people that think flying cars are cool and are willing to take a hundred quid punt on it to get behind it. Once you begin to think of all the places where we need really, really, really bonkers technology built to solve real human problems, but we can't successfully allocate capital to open up that territory, right? the problem is that the people that are holding on to large sums of capital are innately conservative. What we need is recreational hobby investment in new technology on an enormously wide scale to bust open a whole bunch of these fundamental technological blocks to deliver us this flying car utopia that we all feel entitled to. And, you know what I'm going to say, blockchains are the key. I can't see any way of doing this that isn't blockchains from one end to the other. And indeed, Ethereum, the platform, comes from exactly this kind of wildly exuberant crowdfunding exercise. 9,000 people got together and said, we are going to give Vitalik enough money to implement this amazing vision of his because we believe that he's going to change the world into a better place, and off they go to the races. Right? They pile in behind that vision, and because we don't have all the necessary structures in place for this to be formally an equity crowdfunding enterprise, we wind up putting the money into a non-profit, it becomes seed money that the non-profit uses to hire a bunch of programmers to write a bunch of open source software. But if we had equity crowdfunding vehicles available, it's clear we would use one. Ethereum is absolutely not an equity crowdfund when you get right down to the technical detail of how the deal was done because there's no legal way for us to have done it that way. So instead, we have this charitable foundation model that the absolutely fundamental situation is we'd love to build equity crowdfunding platforms on top of Ethereum and the next thing that comes after Ethereum could be legitimately equity crowdfunding. Right? So I'm already seeing, right, you know, I'm making my living right now from technological exuberance expressed as lots of small donations to charity. You see what I'm saying? Right. 
it's amazing. You could do things that nobody else could possibly do. Um, that, oh, ah, right. You draw out my spine me. Real wealth creation results. Right? If you're just using Bitcoin as a way of taking you know, a whole bunch of payments business off a bunch of stupid bankers and giving it to a bunch of actually giving it to nobody because you keep the money, um, you're not actually creating new wealth. Making an existing system more efficient reduces the drag and moves money from the pocket of one middleman to no middleman or leaves it in the pockets of the customers, but it does not create new wealth. What creates new wealth is doing deals that could not otherwise be done. Right? You get a 12 or a 15 party deal, it's impossible to use normal instruments to cut that deal. You come along with some piece of new technology, it enables a more complex kind of multi-party corporation. Boom, you've just achieved wealth creation. So, the notion that we can start creating new wealth by doing impossible deals to fund impossible projects on a huge scale, because lots and lots and lots of nerds are on 100,000 US dollars a year and could easily burn 5 or 10k a year equity crowdfunding stuff. And if you multiply that by 10 million people on tax salaries across the West, you begin to realize it's a river of money that's substantially larger than most governments. Right? Oh, oh, right, oh, you know, you begin to think, like, what is that, you know, 10 million people, 100 billion, billion, 10 billion, 100 billion, right? with relatively conservative assumptions, you could imagine a pipe with 100 billion dollars a year coming out in equity crowdfunding, and that's assuming that none of those crowdfunding projects actually make a bunch of money, because if they do, a lot of that money is likely to be reinvested. So what I'm basically suggesting is that there's a potential for this enormous investment in building the cool future if we could get equity crowdfunding fully legitimized, and I think it's going to have to be done on blockchains for technical reasons. And if that happens, you could begin to see this rolling reinvestment of a pile of money large enough to actually look at projects like Concord and say maybe we should redo that with modern technology. Certainly, there's a whole pile of highly risky things that it would be fascinating to take a crack at doing. And Neil Stephenson talks about this 10 kilometer high tower. And it's actually fairly credible that you can use current material science to build a 10 kilometer high tower. And his approach was basically, well, maybe we should just build one and see what people do with it. Yeah, put an elevator in it, maybe people will hand bite off it, maybe they'll use it for science, maybe they'll just drop things for fun, don't really know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should just build it and see what people do. And I think that that kind of approach is impossible to sell to somebody whose job it is to responsibly manage a bucket of capital. Right? <laughs> but responsibly managing capital is not how human beings made it to the 21st century. We made it by being gonzo. Right? We made it by being crazy. I've got this idea where it's, we're going to go across the desert, and the other side, I think there are going to be more trees. You're mad. Yeah, what's your point? Okay, let's go. Right. And, you know, of course, most of them die in the desert, but the ones that don't succeed. It's impossible to get people who are charged with not losing the money to take enough risks to get real progress. To get real progress, what you need is this attitude that we're just going to shovel the money into the furnace to watch it burn, and once in a while we're going to find an enormous lump of gold in there at the end of the alchemical process. And equity crowdfunding is the way that we can open that river of money up so that we could take all of this wealth which is being poured into the pockets of the technical elite who are bored with the reality that we have given them and we could give them the social mechanisms to turn that money into unbelievable technological acceleration which is more or less the only hope that we actually have of fixing the fundamental problems of the planet we brought. Right? Right now we've got 10 million people, about 7 million women headed for 10 We've got an incredibly rapidly shrinking natural resource base because of things like spreading forests and global warming. And nobody's really looking at this seriously because the governments are just too small minded to really, really, really face it. Oh my god, it's all broken. What are we going to do? I have no idea. Just can't talk about that and still get elected. But what if you get this kind of equity crowdfunding approach for things like radical environmental action? <coughs> Not charities, because charities don't scale. Right? And they do things like take five billion, was it half a billion dollars for Haiti and then build six houses? This whole Rita Red Cross report? Oh my god, what that? Put that on a blockchain and then execute everything that's screen those people. Um, no, we could.
could actually get into this kind of position where most of the world's high technology development is funded by equity crowdfunding from overpaid nerds who love gadgets. And that demographic has enough money that it can outspend the state and most of the big corporations relatively easily. All right? We could get our flying cars, and I think the only missing component is an effective equity crowdfunding problem. Right? And it needs a legal, and it needs technical, and it needs financial, and it might be 50 platforms for a big But I can't see any flaw in the basic argument that if you want to blow the doors off innovation at a global level, this is the missing piece. Right. Other things that might get out of this. Society of stakeholders. Bridges, viaducts, so wind farms, all the rest of that kind of fundamentally boring but worthy stuff. I think that getting the people to go over a bridge to actually raise the money to build the bridge on the basis that they'll be paying their tolls into their own pockets seems like a fairly reasonable approach. I bet there are lots of places where it would work. You would also get a re-democratization re of the way that we manage critical infrastructure. And I think that that's an extremely important thing in the long run because, you know, who owns the means of production, right? Uh, as my friend Jay Springett says, who owns the means of not dying? We've got a political analysis toolkit called Stacktivism, which is all about analyzing ownership of critical infrastructure as a way of understanding the shape of societies. All of that stuff is fundamentally uh, fungible, transformable using equity crowdfunding models if you could figure out how to let people buy shares in a bridge that they're then going to pay tolls to cross. It's the same kind of unification of users and owners that you see when we were talking about the example of what would happen if we'd equity crowdfunded Facebook. No reason that we couldn't do it, and it's a way of doing democratic ownership that doesn't involve going through the mechanisms of the nation state. Stakeholder society. Mrs. Thatcher would almost certainly prove that doesn't mean it's a bad idea. Now, right. Uh, I think I've pretty much covered that. Gets you most of the same benefits. Forgot that part. Gets you most of the same benefits as you would get from nationalising an industry without having to nationalise an industry. Right? You know, this decentralised democratic ownership of assets without having to put the entire thing under the military authority of a nation state in order to have to collectivise them. Right? Small scale petty bourgeoisie collectivisation. You could think of these things as being cooperatives, but however you want to think of them, fundamentally there's this you know, potential for hugely spreading the ownership out among the people that are using the assets because they will be the ones that are most likely to buy in when things float. Um, right. Now, uh, are people bored yet or do we want to go on another one meander? No, I mean, there's so there's answering questions for me, so I mean... Okay, okay. So we'll we'll just check, let me check how we're doing for time because if we... The political thing will take me a minute or two to actually... Yeah, We've well, got ten right. minutes. Ten minutes. This is, I think, the second last slide, so we're okay for time. Right. So, the left believes that the people who work in a factory should own the profit that comes out of the factory. The right believes that the people who finance the factory should own the profits that come from the factory. And that's more or less the entire left-right political debate in a nutshell. Marxism was an industrial age ideology and couldn't be anything else. And Maoism is another story. So, right now, when you take away the idea that wealth is created by industrial production, the left and the right completely disintegrate into a whole lot of loud purple sparks. They're just this divine issue. Right? As soon as you are no longer talking about an industrial uh, generation of wealth, left and right become meaningless. So people often ask me, on the left and right, it's just like, look, I'm post-industrial. And I cannot find any meaningful redefinition of left and right for a post industrial society. Left and right are industrial age concepts. So, what I'm basically going to suggest is this. If you're talking about very, very broad based democratic ownership of assets on the basis that anybody that had a little wealth could buy in, you are still talking about bourgeois democracy. The genuinely poor people cannot participate in a crowdfunded system because they don't have any equity to put in in the first place. Right now, the only people who get, get access to equity as a vehicle are the very rich. If the minimum slab to get involved in the game is 5 million, only the very rich are in there, and the vast majority of the returns in our society go in games which are 5 million as your basic slab. 
Once you begin to spread that and you get down to say $100 as your basic spot, you get a much, 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 much more democratic engagement in the creation of your infrastructure. Many, many more people have an opinion that counts because anybody can get involved in those kind of issues. But it's very important to not analyze this stuff inside of a left-right framework. Because if you try and sell this idea of micro-capitalist investment in local utilities as being an idea of the left, it sounds like you're democratizing things, you're bringing back local ownership, and it's the cooperative movement all over again. On the other hand, if you talk about it from the right, it sounds like what you're talking about is bringing uh, you know, real financial instruments into the reach of far more people that have them already. So it makes sense both from a kind of left perspective and from a right perspective, but it doesn't make sense from an authoritarian perspective. Right. And there's lots of authoritarians on the left and the right that are profoundly against notions of equity crowdfunding. Because for God's sake, you would want people to just run around and band together to go and buy things into existence that they think should be there. That should be our job. We're here to allocate society's capital, not you. Right? Building mechanisms to let the people that own society's capital allocate society's capital by cutting the transaction costs and cutting the red tape is not the strategy that makes sense in the left or right terms. It's a strategy that makes sense of one, the political access which has not yet been defined because we have not yet seen the Hayek or the Marx for the post-industrial age. Right now, post-industrial politics is wasteland. Nobody even remotely begins to understand the political economy and the economic geography which are the fundamental generators of wealth in the societies that we're in. Nobody's got the political economy or the economic geography. As a result, all of the politics are just floating in space because you can't find an accurate map and you can't figure out where the money and the power are. Right. So part of the reason that this whole kind of equity crowdfunding thing has such a hard time gaining political support is because it's so difficult to explain to people why it is in their political interests that equity crowdfunding is the standard way of funding society. I don't even think the libertarians really understand this. It's obviously a great idea for libertarians, but there is no political ideology that says decentralization of ownership by opening up microequity is a critical part of democratization of the functions of the state. And that's the thesis. Right. It's not it? Right. Oh, 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 wait, I forgot about the fun stuff one. Yeah. <laughs> Just one more thing. There are four technologies that are currently going completely nuclear. Yeah. They're just melting down reality. Blockchains, oh my god, but you all knew that. Virtual reality and augmented reality. Has anybody recently strapped a phone to their face? Right, two hands. So they have, oh my phone's over there recording. <coughs> oh, it's still on. Is it still on? Is it still on? Fantastic. Right, so all of this new VR gear, you strap, uh, this is not a phone, but you strap a phone to your face, with a couple of plastic lenses or cardboard box. Google Cardboard is one such brand, Samsung is a thing. Get it from China for a dollar. Yeah, really. Yeah. <laughs> Just amazing, right? And you look around and you get stereo depth perception of the world, only it's not the world you're looking at, it's in a different world. And it works. Mm. Right? The good stuff is really good, the cheap stuff is also really good. It's good enough good. Christmas of this year, I believe there are going to be something like six systems like that on the market on sale at Christmas present prices. Right. Oculus want to do a full you know, user aid one, don't they? Yeah, you bet. Right. They'll sell you better. And that's coming, that's, I think that's this year, is that this yeah, Christmas? Yeah, that'll, that'll be the big Christmas present this year, after drones last year. After drones last year, right. Exactly. So, by the end of this year, oh, I don't know, a third of the teenagers in America from middle class households will have virtual reality gear. That's a really substantial change in things. I, I had my first virtual reality experience in 1991. Wow. Same 26 years. Yeah, that's 25 years ago. Trocadero? Earlier than that. Eight, eight years, I think. No more man time. So once it arrives, once this stuff is actually here, you're going to see this sudden fracturing because it's a technological jump that society as a whole is not ready for. And because society as a whole is not ready for it, it's going to be demonized in the worst possible way. Right? It's just like you know, all of the cyberpunk literature or cyberpunk literature of the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, all of that tearing between the regular people and their kids who are gargling around and won't come out with their virtual realities, all of that stuff is just going to be, it's going to be hilarious, possibly all. Right? But it's coming and nothing can stop it and nobody's ready. Technology, meltdown, nobody knows what to do, it's coming. Oh my god. This is such exciting. Oh, yeah, exciting. Uh, a lot terrified, but I mean, I've been waiting for a virtual.
virtual reality my entire adult life and finally it's here. And it's cheap because your kid already has an iPhone and it's an iPhone plus a cardboard box. <laughs> what? And the notion that the phone, you know, it ate the TV and it ate the phone and it ate the web browser and it ate the phone camera and it ate the recorder and it ate this mock gun and now it's about to eat the virtual reality. You know, the phone is rapidly becoming this you know, unique, powerful, you know, like, magical artifact. So, by the end of this year, knee deep in virtual reality networks, massive sales campaigns telling people how cool the virtual world is, people will be piling into that for like there's no tomorrow. Um, drones, robots, internet things. Every time I see another drone, like you know, some kid will be rubbing drone around in their backpack and go, it's that orange thing. You know, one and a half inch square drone, ten minute flight time, you control it by balancing it with your phone and it's an automatic hover. Ah, where did you get that? There's a buck fifty from China, I found it in back of a you know, cereal packet, you know, the world is rapidly turning into drones and robots that actually work. Nobody's yet figured out what they're for yet, but I don't think it'll be that long before Amazon will do like drone delivery to your picnic. You know, did you run out of cheese? Uh, beer delivery at festivals, medical uses, and flying samples around in hospital, there could be all kinds of uses. But once that process begins, the notion that you actually have to physically carry things from place to place rather than having a drone come and fetch it and carry it for you. Right? Could you run this key over to Bob, please? You know, Uber droning keys around the city. Of course, that would be worth it you haven't modernized your locks yet, but you know, there's lots of physical movement and stuff that will just evaporate, errand running, just go to work. Um, not quite the same kind of discontinuous boom that we're going to see with virtual reality this year, but coming along very nicely. 3D printers, I would also put in there, but I think that's still fine it out and really making a difference. Finally, artificial intelligence, not in the sense of artificial people, but in terms of problem solving, is now a fact, right? Computers can finally tell the difference between a cat and a dog more effectively than a human being. Right? Travel planning. Give me a system that says I want to meet these seven people, find me the cheapest and easiest location in Europe for us all to meet. And it goes all the way through the travel systems. We could do that tomorrow. Watson. Right? Medical diagnosis, and it can answer pop quiz questions. Why we don't have a clean interface where you can just ask a question, what's it for a fiber, and it'll come back with an answer I don't know yet. What's it? What is the best HDTV set? Five dollars, cheaper twice the price. Soundhound. Soundhound, yeah? What does Soundhound do? Oh, find the demo. It, it's, it can ask, answer crazy questions like, What's the area, uh, square kilometer area of China and India and the relative populations and what's their capital city wow. and what is the population of those and what's the area dialing code for Germany? So that fast and it'll give you the answer instantly. That's so quite a lot of questions in one as well. So it's basically, yeah. so it's basically useful artificial intelligence on a phone? Yeah, last so week it came out, the demo videos out there, SoundHound. Sound. It's the SoundCloud so. people, it's what they've really been working on, mm -hmm. where uh, the SoundCloud was their kind of like diversion really? app. Yeah. That's amazing. It's crazy good. Oh, I want to see this. Right. So, blockchains are going nuclear, VR and AR are going nuclear, drones, robots, internet things are going nuclear, and artificial intelligence are going nuclear. Right. Boom. Who's going to fund the areas where these things intersect? given that individually each one of these things is right at the limit of our current app bureaucratic appetite for risk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's my suggestion, right? If each one of these things is already at the limit of DC appetite for risk, the intersections between these things will definitionally be too risky for DCs to go into. So my suggestion is that we take this kind of ultra-technology apocalypse thing which is currently happening this year, next year, and for the next five years and we figure out how to build equity crowdfunded vehicles so that we can take the excess cash of 10 million nerds and use it as a 10 billion dollar a year funnel to get our bloody flying cars funded. Right? Because we've got the possibility of unbelievable technological acceleration in the intersection between these technologies, but it's going to involve enormous amounts of really expensive technical labor doing more or less trial and error. And my suggestion is that we basically close the loop on the dot-com ecosystem and have the nerds fund their friends, the other nerds, to do this stuff in micro-capital enterprises as a way of rapidly pulling these technologies into existence in domains where venture capital is simply too risk averse because they don't understand 
Или здесь, где 